Okay. Many people have written to me on Facebook about what is diabetic retinopathy. It is a very common thing to have diabetes nowadays in India because our people do not exercise, they consume a lot of fat, fast food or fatty food or carb carbohydrates and very often our physicians don't tell our patients to go and check their eyes. So diabetic retinopathy is a condition where diabetes affects the nerve of the eye, that is the retina of the eye. Retina is something that is situated very deep inside the eye. Till it affects to a great extent, we will not know that we have diabetic retinopathy. The only option for patients to find out whether they have diabetic retinopathy is to go to an ophthalmologist and check their eyes. And how often should they be doing it? Every year. When should be the first checkup for a patient who has got diabetic retinopathy? Actually, a patient who does not have diabetic retinopathy and instead starts to have diabetes should check their eyes first. Because the first time you check your eyes, the doctor will see what is the actual normal situation inside the eye. Because what is normal is not fixed. All of us have different rates. So what is normal is variable. What is normal for me may not be normal for you. So it is best to get an idea of what is normal for you. So as soon as a patient is diagnosed with diabetes, it is advisable to check the eyes. At least within the first one month of a confirmed diabetic diagnosis. So in that time, the doctor will see your vision. He will check the eye pressure. I mean, he will see the lens, whether you have cataract or not. And of course, he will check the retina to see whether diabetes has affected the retina. Because a diagnosis of diabetes can be made even after 5-6 years of a patient being diabetic. A patient may not be knowing that he has got diabetes. But when you check a patient's blood, blood for diabetes, you may be having 200-300 level of blood sugar. And it is often seen that the patient has been having diabetes for 4-5 years and it has been unnoticed. So the first time you check whether you have diabetic retinopathy, you might actually have diabetic retinopathy. So even if you don't have diabetic retinopathy, it is wise to get for a go for a checkup. So I shall now show you what is the normal picture of a retina taken with the help of a fundus camera. This is called a fundus camera where a patient undergoes dilatation of the eyes, where you put drops in the eye and the pupil is dilated and an eye doctor can check the photographs taken, taken with this machine. So this is the photograph of a normal retina. So these are the blood vessels. This is called the optic nerve. This yellow spot is called the optic nerve. This is not actually yellow, but looks yellow compared to the pink surrounding of the retina. So this is the optic nerve. That is the optic nerve that is coming from the brain. This is the point where all what you see is transmitted to the brain. This dark spot is called the macula, where you see fine vision. And all the blood vessels support this area. So when I look at you or another person, I see the face with this area and all what is surrounding in the room or any other people sitting with you are seen by these areas. But everything finally has to go through here to the brain. So any disease that affects this part or this part can affect our vision. But any disease that affects this part will not be noticed for you because that is not the point of the retina where you are using to see what you are seeing actually. Actually, this area is to see the surroundings and we might actually not be aware of what we are missing in the surroundings. So it is very important to get a picture taken to see the entire retina, whether it is normal or not. And how do we see the actual representation of the vessels? We have a test called angiography. The same thing what is used in cardiac angiogram. But that is to image the heart. The eye angiography is very simple. All what we have to do is take an injection into the arm and then take photographs. Unlike a cardiac angiogram, the patient need not be admitted. 
and it is not a major invasive procedure so once the dye called sodium fluorescein is injected inside the eye we darken the room and take photographs this is the angiogram picture which shows the blood vessels clearly now they are white in color because this is a black and white photograph and the dye that is a sodium fluorescein dye which we injected into the arm is white in color because it fluoresces so all the blood vessels are now clearly visible if there was even a slight bleeding of any blood vessel it would be shown as a white outpouring from one of these blood vessels so it's very easy for a patient to know or a doctor to know whether they got diabetic retinopathy now let us consider some people who have got diabetic retinopathy now this is a patient who's got diabetic retinopathy now you can see the retina is faded it is not pink anymore it is sort of orange crimson and we see some yellowish deposits here now these yellowish deposits are lipids cholesterol but diabetic retinopathy means a patient who has got diabetes that means your blood sugar is high how did cholesterol come here very simple diabetic retinopathy causes our blood vessels to leak so when the blood vessels leak blood comes out and along with the blood sugar cholesterol and all the cells come out so and they start depositing here and after some time our body our retina uses up the blood sugar and the blood disappears but the fats you know are insoluble they get deposited there and fat is yellow in color so that is what we see here deposited so these are cholesterol deposits that appear in diabetic retinopathy because of the reason i told you so a diabetic patient should always check their cholesterol level because a high triglyceride level may also interfere with your diabetic retinopathy treatment so these are nothing but fats now let us see how this appears on angiography this is the angiography picture of the same patient now you can see various white spots here and these white spots are the places where the blood vessels are leaking this hot white spots or the intense white spots are the areas of high leaking but you saw in the color picture this is the only area we thought was leaking but you can see in the angiograph that is not the only area there are other areas so that is the advantage of taking an angiogram you will see those areas which you can't see on a natural photograph or when a doctor sees with a natural eyes so all these spots now are spots with leaking now what is the treatment for this the treatment is very simple if it is at an early stage it's very simple all you have to do is control your diabetes most people have seen check only the fasting blood blood glucose level and any patient who checks if you see randomly 60% of them will have a fasting blood glucose of 120 130 though they will think controlled with the very same patient when they go for a blood glucose level check up after taking food will have 250 260 so patient get a false sense of security by checking only their fasting blood glucose that is fbs so fbs might be normal but the ppbs or the blood sugar after food may actually be very high so ideal situation is you check both now if you don't have time to check on the same day check fasting blood sugar today you may have a glucometer at home with you check the fasting sugar today and check the after food tomorrow at least twice a week you should be doing this two readings per week of fasting blood glucose level two readings per week of after food that is called ppbs that is one of the methods to control diabetic retinopathy that is control your blood glucose the other and the most significant is physical exercise you will notice that i have not told you to cut down your intake of sugars 
because that is the least important thing what is most important is to control your blood sugar either by medicines but i would prefer that a patient take insulin because insulin is natural it occurs in the body it is not a chemical as you know all diabetic tablets are chemicals but when you need to take tablets you need to take but first preference is always insulin a tablet is a chemical and any chemical has an effect and a undesired effect that is called side effect and most of the tablets for diabetes either affect the kidney or the liver as you know diabetes affects the eye the kidney the heart and the nerves how does it affect the eye diabetic retinopathy or cataract or glaucoma how does it affect the kidney diabetic nephropathy how does it affect the heart diabetic cardiomyopathy or you can have heart heart attack silent heart attack it is called right? the patient with diabetes will not know the pain of a heart attack and a patient who has diabetic retinopathy diabetic neuropathy that is affects the nerves will have less sensation so he will not know whether there is a tiny prick cut on the foot and that might get infected patient will still not notice it because there is no pain and you might end up losing a toe or a leg so if you if you can recollect i told diabetic nephropathy as a second problem you are taking a tablet that will affect your kidney and you also have diabetes that will affect your kidney so it's a double insult on the kidney insulin has no such undesired effects other than a fall in glucose level if you take too much insulin but you are going to take a fixed insulin dose that your doctor has suggested for you now how will a patient have hypoglycemia or low glucose if you consume less food than you normally take that is the only reason or if you suddenly start exercising so ideal way to control diabetes is either insulin or reduce your carbohydrate intake you can take proteins reduce your carbohydrate intake but importantly you should exercise if you walk for 20 minutes a day that will be the best thing you can do for you and i have seen many patients who tell me i don't have the time to walk i ask why no morning walk is difficult it is raining in the morning it is windy in the morning but it is not a rule that you have to walk in the morning you can walk even in the evening and you need not walk on the road i always tell my patients i insist that you don't walk on the road because you might get bitten by a dog or hit by a bus you can walk in the front courtyard of your house or you can drive to one public stadium and walk there or a park and walk there those are things you can do very easily walking on a front courtyard is the very easy thing you can do and for patients who have diabetic neuropathy who say they can't walk try to walk with a walker or a walking stick so these are the ways you can control diabetic retinopathy the other treatment part of it is suppose it is not working out within 3 4 weeks we go for laser and there are many misconceptions about laser in olden days laser was actually a sort of fire power where we used to burn the retina now it is no more like that a laser is nothing but a green light and that induces a local coagulation that means the blood clots there with the accompanied slight increase in temperature because it is a coagulation and it has no other undesired effects so a doctor will photocoagulate that is laser coagulate this particular area where it is leaking and nowhere else and that particular area gets healed now let's see another patient now this is another patient with diabetic retinopathy with the yellow deposit still still another patient with the yellow deposit not so evident as in the other patients but you go for the angiography there are more bleed 
bleeding sites. This is another patient with lot of yellow spots. You see the angiography, you can see it is not leaking that much. So, there is no rule that what you see clinically may be what, you, what the angiography tells you because here if you see there is a leaking. But the actual yellow deposit was here even though there are only pinpoint leaks. So, that is why an angiography is very critical. It helps a doctor to know what is the actual state of the disease and also do the treatment. Now, let us go back to the first patient. Now, this was the first patient who had significant yellow deposits. We did the angiogram. Now, I told you the treatment is control diabetes and then do laser. This is the result. Now, you can see the yellow deposits which you could see here have now diminished. So, laser has worked. Now, if this patient has to remain like this, diabetes has to be controlled very well. Laser one time is not a cure for everything because laser only cured what the present condition was. It does not guarantee that another leaking may not come. That depends on you, the patient. If your blood glucose level is under very good control and you do exercise properly, another leak may not never come. But if the diet is not controlled, another leak will come and subsequent laser treatment is necessary. So, patients always ask me, why do you have to keep on doing laser year after year? Is there any harm to doing laser year after year? The answer is very simple. As long as you have diabetes, you have the tendency for bleeding vessels in the retina. And if the diabetes is not under control, it will leak again and again. As often as it leaks again and again, laser is needed. So, every year if it leaks, every year laser is necessary. And if you stop doing laser, the leak gets worse and worse. Finally, the vision suffers. And we will come to a stage where injections are necessary inside the eye. Now, when you hear injections, you are terrified. But that is the treatment that is final. And if you realize there is no treatment for diabetic retinopathy in surgery, that is 100 percent successful. Because surgery itself is the last resort. So, which are the conditions where surgery might be necessary? Let us see that. Now, these are some patients who have got frank blood. See the blood, red color here? This is frank blood. Now, these are the yellow deposits. Those are the leaks that happened over a time. Slow leaks and the blood absorbed and the yellow deposits are left behind. That can be done with mild laser. Now, these are the heavy bleeding. That means, the blood keeps on coming, so it remains red in color. There is no time for the eye to absorb it. Keeps on coming. So, you have to do a large amount of laser to stop it. Or you have to do an injection immediately that will solve this problem. Sometimes, injection may not work because the blood may be so severe. And you have to do a surgery to evacuate the blood. And when we do a surgery to evacuate the blood, we have to do surgery near the retina. And we take out the blood, we take out the jelly, the vitreous jelly which was supporting the nerve and we put in an oil to keep the eyeball in shape. Because eye you know is filled with water or a jelly. Now, we have to replace that jelly with oil and the vision will never be the same again. Though it will be much better than how you were before the surgery, but it will, can never return to normal. So, we should be treating diabetic retinopathy even before this sort of things. And this is the angiography of the patient. Now, we saw the blood and this is the area where it is leaking. This is a large area, white area we can see here. And this is the picture on top. See, again, 
new vessels are formed there and is leaky. So in diabetes what happens is some areas now are deprived of blood because it is leaking here and it is blocked. So what does the nerves try to do? Some areas do not have blood now. So it will try to grow new vessels and these are the new vessels. But that happens over a short period of time the retina tries to make new vessels and they are never as strong as our original vessels. So when we sneeze or when we take heavy weights or when we fall down or when we cough these bleed. So this has got proliferative diabetic neuropathy where new vessels are suddenly forming. That is the most dangerous thing that can happen to anybody's eye. Because even if you sneeze this will bleed and the bleeding is like a rain, torrent of blood. It may not be amenable for laser. At this stage also we can try laser, we can close these blood vessels. But there is no guarantee that laser might work fully. Because there is already significant damage in the retina for this to happen. So ideal situation is when we treat our diabetic retinopathy as soon as it comes. So this is another patient who has been treated. Now the bleeding has gone. But still you can see with the diabetic retinopathy there are mild white spots but the heavy bleeding has gone. This is another patient which I told you this is the optic nerve. Now that has grown new blood vessels. These are faint blood vessels here. Now let us see the angiography of that. See the heavy bleeding here and that has happened on the optic nerve that is even more difficult to treat because it is no more on the retina it is on the optic nerve that is now connecting to the brain. So we will require a laser but we cannot do laser on this because it is the most critical part and the laser will not work here. We have to do laser on the surroundings might have to take a neurologist's help. Now two branches of medicine have come in and you know when more than one branch of medicine comes in things are very serious. So in order to escape all this the best way is to treat the diabetic retinopathy at the earliest. I got a lot of queries from pregnant ladies stating my husband has got an eye problem or I have got an eye problem what can I do to prevent that from happening to my child? Suppose I get pregnant now what can I do? This is a very interesting question because if you are able to do something that will determine the final vision of your unborn child that is the most challenging, the most difficult and the most satisfying thing any mother could do. To answer that question I have to explain about the formation of the eye. The eye forms even before our brain starts to form really well. The eye is almost the first thing that we can actually see in an embryo. After 14 days of fertilization the eye starts to develop well. It is estimated that it starts by 7th day. At the first 3 months the eye has developed by at least 80 percent of the normal size and the remaining 20 percent is kept for later which I will explain later. So the first 3 months if you notice is when the maximum development happens in the eye. But all the other organs develop after the first 3 months. They develop well after the first 3 months. So what happens normally in a pregnant lady is they do not know they are pregnant by around at least one month passes before they know they are pregnant. And they normally go to a gynecologist only by around 45 days or 2 months. That is when the gynecologist starts a B complex tablet or a FIFOL tablet that contains iron and B complex. As you know the eye is a very nervous tissue, it is full of nerves and it develops in the same germ layer that the brain develops. And B complex or B vitamins are very essential for nerves to develop. 
So if you wait 45 days to 2 months to start that tablet or if a diet is not adequate enough to, con to contain enough vitamin B, the development of the eye suffers. It is mathematical. So if you are planning for a pregnancy, I would assume that you have to start a B complex or a proper diet when you start planning for a pregnancy because you never know. When the time the pregnancy test comes positive, the eye would have started developing. So B complex vitamin is very essential for the eye to develop and you should be starting it when you plan for the pregnancy or as the first instance that you know that you may be pregnant. Don't wait till you confirm that you are pregnant, at least when you know that you may, may be pregnant, start it. Because 80% of the development takes place within the first three months. And that is when the most things can go wrong also. Several infections that happen during pregnancy affect the eye. And they will happen during the first three months. They are called the Torch syndrome, that is Toxoplasma, Rubella, Cytomegalovirus and Herpes. So what is Toxoplasma? Toxoplasma is a protozoal infection that happens to people who keep pets in their house, usually cats. So when you pet a cat and you don't wash your hand and then go to eat something or you don't have to eat even, your mouth feels like scratching and you suddenly scratch your mouth, that germ goes inside your mouth. Even if you don't pet the cat and the pet travels across your dining floor, dining table, that is enough to shed the toxoplasma organism. And that gets into the pregnant lady's system and it travels to the eye, either to the mother's eye or the infant's eye. Most commonly, it goes to the unborn child's eye and the child is born with one eye blind or both eyes blind. This is the most common thing that we see. But nowadays the frequency is decreasing because we don't keep so many cats in our house anymore. The other is cytomegalovirus. This can be seen as small warts or small white pimples that occur near the eye. Herpes, you know, one variant of herpes is chickenpox. So if you know a relative is having chickenpox or somebody is having chickenpox, I would advise a pregnant lady or a lady who is planning to get pregnant not to go near them. Rubella is also called German measles. All the female children are supposed to be vaccinated against it. In our childhood, we all get vaccinated against MMR, that is measles, mumps, rubella. But we forget to take the booster dose when we are at the age of 9 to 15. That is where the problem happens usually. But India is fortunate to have less rubella cases. And these are the conditions that will affect the eye of the unborn child. So first you have to take care of your diet. You have to eat, advocate green leafy vegetables, which is a must in your diet. You must eat small fish, not fried, either boiled or curry. Must eat plenty of fruits. And if you can take a supplement, take a B-complex supplement. I will stress that it is a supplement. A supplement means you are adding to what you have already naturally taken. A supplement is not a substitute. And if you don't take green leafy vegetables or other natural sources of vitamin B and you start taking supplements, that is not a substitute. So have a good diet and take the supplements if you can. And the remaining 20% is very interesting. I will say that I started off developing within the first three months and finish the completion work in the last three weeks. So three months in the beginning and three weeks at the end are very critical. At the three weeks of the end of pregnancy, what happens is the nerves of the retina start completing the work. If you see in this, what will be formed will be only till here. The last three weeks is when the Final blood vessels.
start to come and they grow outwards if a child is born premature there is not enough time for the retina to have blood vessels so some part of the retina may not have blood vessels because if a child is born one month before it is a preterm child and there is no time for the retina to finish developing the blood vessels and that condition is called retinopathy of prematurity or rop who are at risk for rop mothers who have taken infertility treatment for getting children because they are high risk pregnancies and may need to be induced into labor much before time and those babies have a tendency to be delivered before time also underweight babies it is very significant to note that babies below 2000 grams or 2 kilos are at the highest risk for retinopathy of prematurity so any baby that is born before 3 weeks or having a weight less than 2500 grams i would say has a risk of developing an eye problem a baby who is suspected of having rop must have an eye exam next day after birth it is very vital sometimes you might forget or the pediatrician might forget but i would advise you to remember that because what happens in rop is the nerve the nerve does not have blood vessels and the eye has started functioning so the retina in an emergency starts creating new blood vessels but they are never as strong as what would have formed naturally and they start bleeding and they start bleeding and the retina starts contracting and the child will lose sight by one week or two weeks and there is nothing nothing can anybody can do after that no surgery can help so it is very vital that we recognize that our child is preterm or underweight check the eye immediately you can suggest to the doctor even check the eye immediately and make sure that all the blood vessels are there if they are not there then we know that the eye will start to make the blood vessels and they will bleed so we have done laser for children who are even one day old because laser has to be done to prevent that bleeding that will prevent the blindness but unfortunately the child will never have normal vision because normal vision would have come only when the child is fully term or the birth weight is very good at least we can preserve 70% or half the vision that is very great because otherwise we would be losing that child's vision the other thing is we now see a lot of babies who have watering from the eye after birth lot of babies compared to 30 years ago or 20 years ago where their incidence would be two babies per 100 live births now it is almost 40 to 50% why as we know our eye has tears the tears don't drain out like how we think they drain out they evaporate yes but there are more tears in the eye then can account for evaporation so the tears have to drain somewhere so they drain with a tube connected from the eye to the nose so excess tears in the eye come to the nose to the throat and then is swallowed and the tube that connects the eye to the nose opens only one week before actual birth so any baby that is born before that has a high likelihood that the nose part of the of that duct has not opened so whatever tears are there in the eye will go to the nose will find that the hole is not open and then come back to the eye and the eye starts water after some time what tears are there inside that duct get infection and the eye starts getting pus so this is what is happening to almost all newborns nowadays because they are delivered preterm 
most commonly the family is at fault because according to astrological predictions they will tell the doctor that i want a child of this star and that will be 2 weeks or 3 weeks before estimated birthday this must not be done because you are compromising your child's eye and any child who is born fully term has very least or very less likely chances of having an eye problem it is very vital to remember the first 3 months and the last 3 weeks because that will determine your child's vision and eye health as i told you the first 3 months is when the eye develops 80 percent so what should we not do during the first 3 months you should not indulge in heavy travel because there may be slight bleeding that can come because of bumpy travel or lot of stress most gynecologists will tell you the slight bleeding nothing will happen but you must remember that that is the time that is critical for the eye we cannot allow for a bleeding that is above slight so heavy travel or bumpy travel is something you should definitely avoid another thing is exposure to x-rays that is very critical because in the first three months is when the development actually takes place and we don't want any mutations or genetic transformations at that stage the third thing that women are likely to ignore is laser when i mean laser it is not an eye laser nowadays there are a lot of centers and lot of parlors offering hair removal lasers it can be in the face it can be on the body but you remember when the eye is developing no form of laser is to be applied whether skin lasers or eye lasers or any laser i would go so far as to advise you not even to go for a laser show No, no. <laughs> okay. 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 The other things we have to avoid is the other thing we have to avoid during the first three months is any sort of medicines that you don't actually urgently require. pregnant ladies who are pregnant you know they are pregnant or they are planning to get pregnant must avoid alcohol because alcohol can affect the brain can affect the eye development must avoid smoking lot of ladies will now think i am not smoking but you must remember passive smoking is more dangerous than active smoking so if your husband or somebody in your family or a granddad who or smokes a pregnant lady should never be around the ideal situation is where you counsel your husband or your family member to stop smoking so that the unborn child's eye and health are not affected and medications and common medications if you can avoid it is better avoided